with your extensive experience here in the league um, and looking at some of the details, right, of that came out of this CBA, but also looking at looking at these details in a lens where there are different points that are going to be started, like different steps that are going to be taking place throughout this. I mean, there was, there's the concept of free agency, right? There's the concept, concept of like contract terms. There's, it's insane to think about, but the, the fact that something like, Hey, we're not going to be playing on substandard pitches anymore is a thing that needs to be included in a CBA, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Is there one thing in particular in this CBA that is most important for you personally or that you feel connected to on a personal level that was a big victory um well I have two I believe that having free agency is at the beginning of 2023 for the players that have had six years of service will be given unrestricted free agency um you know I think for the veteran players in this league that might not play for the entirety of the term of the CBA to give players back some autonomy over their career. And, you know, as, as immediately as we could, um, and that has never been given to anyone in this league, if you ever, and to be able to give that back to players who have basically built this league, their own blood, sweat, sweat and tears and their sacrifice. I think that is huge. And, as a player from to have the, you know, to be out of contract next year and to have the ability to be a free agent, which I've never experienced in my playing career is huge to just be able to like go out and see the market and invite a competitive, you know, environment between clubs and hopefully drive the market and drive salaries up. And I just think that is such a powerful thing. And I don't think in 2022 going into 2023, I don't believe you can be, or you can consider yourself a professional league if you don't have some form of free agency. And so to have that um, and to give people the ability to have control over their careers is something that is just such a gift and it hasn't been given to so many players. And I hope, you know, it is something that players that have, that are veterans in this league are really cherish and are grateful for because yeah, it, it is kind of unimaginable. It's kind of just ridiculous that that's never been given to players. And to be fair, like in terms of it being six years and um, it being at the start of, 2023 there are reasons behind that and and the reasons are hopefully that drives the market if we were to do it in any other way it would increase free agency so it wouldn't have the benefit that we would hope so in that way I think that there's a balance and it allows definitely the players that have given a lot to this league to once again have a choice in where they play next and that's really exciting and creates excitement in the league it creates like the ability to really like get to see where free agents go and what yeah. happens and to finally be like oh you actually don't have my rights i do like to have that for the first time is so incredibly monumental and i'm just so proud of that the second is um which you know kind of in the bigger scheme of things is like probably lower on the totem pole but Yes, the fact that we now have a standard for our fields and what we what is required by organizations to have and adhere to is huge. And I think a lot of in like the NWSL and the league in general has, you know, succumbed to this thinking of like, we're just grateful that someone is willing to buy a team or someone's willing to be a part of the NWSL. And so when you have that, you kind of lose the ability to set a standard and what you allow to come in is a lack of a lack of a standard that is acceptable for the talent of women that is in this league. So, and I think you saw that with, you know, Salt Lake city going back to Kansas city and, you know, it's a temporary thing and it's going to be okay. It's a baseball field. And honestly, the, the parody of driving past, 
the MLS stadium and then turning left into the minor league baseball stadium. I'm just like, this is not okay. And just out of just safety for players and the ability for like our talents to be showcased, you're not going to see that on a unregulated smaller field Mm -hmm. in which you have three different forms of turf and the turf is coming up when you kick a ball it's just not good enough. And on top of that, I think this league is deserving of being put in the best environment in order for people to want to come and watch what is being put on the field and the product that's on the field. And no fan, whether like the only fans that are showing up are either diehard fans or you have some type of personal relationship with someone on the field. No fan wants to watch a game through a net 50 yards away trying to figure out where the ball is and watching a product that just is significantly reduced because of what you're required to play on. And for me as a player, when this issue came up and you would be surprised how much pushback and how long it took to get this to be agreed to. And when it came up, I basically told Megan, we were on a call and I was just like, listen, it's year 10. We're going into year 10 of this league. If people want to come into this league, there's a standard that we are going to uphold that players deserve. And in doing so, it allows the product to be shown in the way that it's supposed to be shown and keeps players safe. But we can no longer allow for temporary things to be long periods of time seasons on seasons and I'm like that's great if someone wants to come into the league and we are not asking you to go build a multi-million dollar stadium and have it all sorted all we're asking is that we have a soccer specific field and pitch to play on that is within FIFA regulations that is safe for the time which you get things sorted and if you can't do that sell the team you're not welcome here we'll find someone else. And I think that is where we have, that is where I hope that the CBA starts to turn over, that it's no longer from a place of like, oh, we're so grateful. It's from a place of like, we're betting on ourselves. This should be better. This is the standard. If you want to be a part of it, this is where you have to, this is the level in which you have to invest. And if you can do that, great. If you can't, we'll see you in a couple of years. As a former player myself and a broadcaster in the NWSL, I think um, when I read these terms, having standard field size was one of the things that stuck out to me. And it, my first reaction was, why was this not already in place? But as you mentioned, it wasn't the norm. There wasn't a standard benchmark that was mandated in the league and to get a standard size field that is <laughs> normal turf or grass, whatever it may be, will elevate the level of play overall. will elevate the fans. As you mentioned coming, it'll elevate the broadcast because broadcasters will be mm-hmm. able to see a little bit better uh, than the screens. There's so many different levels of this um, and you touched on so many of them, but Mary, you talked about honoring the veterans in the league and the players that came before you in the NWSL and in all the other professional leagues in the United States. At the end of the Players Association statement, it said um, to the players that came before us, we stand on your shoulders and we hope to make you proud. Those players and, and all of the veterans and all of the retired players, have you had a chance to talk to any of them? I know a lot of them are still involved, but have you had a chance to talk to them or, or what would you say to them in terms of this historic CBA? Um. I haven't had a chance to speak to a lot of veteran players or um, players that have come before, more specifically players that have been in this league before us or in the WPS. And, um, but I have spoken to some of the veteran players in this league and just like the amount of appreciation that is been just outpouring and just how grateful people are to have, you know, to know that, they have been fought for and that they've been heard and that there is change and that they can once again, feel proud to play for the NWSL or start to, um, I think is really important, but to all the people that, to all the players and all the women that came before us, I mean, there are so many women that are no longer playing that shaped who I am as a player and helped shape my career. And 
you know, put, took me under their wing and just like brought me up and allowed me to be myself and to play this game that I love. And for that, I'm just forever grateful. And, you know, in so many ways have kind of laid the path for just being like, this is what is right. And this is what is not right. And we might not have the power now to change it, but I'm going to stand up for what I believe in and what I know to be right. And I mean, when I speak, I think of like Lauren Cheney, who was um, my teammate, my first and second year in Kansas city. And the amount of times she just like went to bat for us because she's like, this is not right. This is not, this is below a standard and I'm willing to stick my neck out because I can, and I have the power to, I think just to watch her lead in such a way and like to really just always fight for the greater good and know that like we as women are deserving. I think that really stuck with me for a long time. And I, I don't, don't think I realized the impact of that until like I was much older and a bit more mature, but yeah, I think like just having people like that, that were like, yeah, this isn't good enough. And it might not change right now, but I'm willing to like bet that bet on myself and know the power in which we have as a collective to keep moving forward. And, um, and I know that Lauren is like so many other players that came before me that did that on a regular basis. And this league wouldn't be here if it weren't for players like her. So we are so, so thankful.